Okay. Awesome. Um, let's let's get down to it. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, Foley again here. Uh, you're not here to see and listen to me, so I want to get right down to it. Our guest is a multi-talented performer, uh, star of stage and screen, Tony <laughs> Award-winning Broadway performer. You've got a new album out that just came out on the 10th. You've got a new TV series coming out next month. And of course, you've appeared in a certain show that we like about candy-colored magical friendship horses. I'm delighted <laughs> to, to, to introduce the one and only Lena Hall. Welcome. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming. Yeah, of course. So, um, <laughs> Let's uh, let's get started with I guess what is the most obvious uh, question right now, which is how are you doing? How are you holding up in this uh, very odd time that we're all living in? I'm doing pretty good, you know. Um, it's very surreal, obviously. Um, I'm usually I'm in Brooklyn, uh, New York, and um, it just so happened that last year. My husband and I got married, but we decided to forego a big wedding. So ah. we elo eloped instead so we could buy a house, awesome. like, a, like a vacation home, you know, a couple a hours. permanent out vacation. <laughs> yeah, a couple hours outside of New York. And, um, and it just happens to be where we're holed up. So this house, um, I'm getting to a lot of projects that I never thought I would get to. And I'm doing a lot of home improvement is basically what I've been doing. Is that the, <laughs> the main projects on home improvement or are you working on some other stuff? What sort of uh, projects? It's a, what sort of, well, painting and I just fixed my gutters today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, very domestic. Uh, but, you know, I'm also trying to work on some um, music stuff and like I just released my album um, and that album I had been holding on to for years uh, I had just never felt like a good time to release it and then I was home and I was like I should just release it now because people need to do stuff and they need listening pleasure and uh, and the only way that I really know how to connect with people that well is through music so for me, it was um, more of a reaching out to um, connect with people. The only way I know how <laughs> and, um, by yeah, singing. I very much appreciated. I'm, I'm sure I can certainly say that for myself, it was much appreciated. I love it. Awesome. Uh, but let's. We're going to get to talking about that. But let's um, let's take a step back, all the way back. Um, when did <laughs> you first uh, fall in love with music? How did you get into music when when you were little? Was it something you didn't really discover until later on? I was born into a family of um, artists. Basically, my father had his own ballet company and my mother was his prima ballerina. And uh, I grew up always at the ballet studio listening to music. My parents would play music constantly in the house. Um, and the music always kind of ranged from classical to like um Jimi Hendrix you know Janis Joplin the Beatles so the classic. It, yeah so it was uh it was a little wide range of um this amazing classical music and opera to you know some really good standard basic rock and roll and then also some really like out there psychedelic weird stuff too because <laughs> my parents are you know are you know of the hippie era and, and this is san really francisco right that you this is uh, san francisco yeah they hate ashbury so I grew up, yeah i grew up in the heart of that and um my parents lived that so that's what was so so that's how i got into music was just by default and then I played the piano when I was starting five. Um, and so I was, I'm a classical, like classically trained pianist, although I'm horribly out of practice. And, uh, and I started singing because my sister was singing. And, um, but I had been dancing my whole life. So, um, so basically, like music is just a part of my expression. So what was your first professional gig with music? Well, my first professional gig was as a dancer when I was three years old. Oh, um, okay. <laughs> and uh, my first singing role uh, job, which maybe it wasn't professional because I did it for free, but I, uh, I had no choice in the matter. Um, <laughs> I, was, I was seven years old and um, Pope John Paul II was coming to San Francisco and one of the kids singers dropped out last minute and I happened to be standing there singing along with them and they asked me to do it. So oh, wow. my first real big singing job was at 
Candlestick Stadium in San Francisco in 1987 and singing for the Pope. <laughs> oh, goodness. Talk about being thrown in at the deep end. <laughs> yeah. And uh, all I remember was that we had to get up super early. It was really cold and uh, it was chaos. <laughs> this is just utter chaos. And we forgot our lyrics during the song. I remember okay. that. Yeah. It was great. <laughs> but you made it through. We made it through. Yeah. We Sorry. made it. <laughs> So from there, from, from John Paul II, how do you go from there to, to Broadway and eventually to Pony, which we'll get to in a little while because we've seen a lot of Pony questions. But what, when, did you, when did you make that leap to Broadway? Um, when I was 12, my sister was doing shows with this like community theater program um, mm. called the Young People's Teen Musical Theater Company. It's a mouthful. And uh, it was just based in San Francisco. And I saw her in one of the shows and I thought, oh my God, I want to do that. And so I auditioned for the company as well. And I ended up doing musical theater with them all throughout my high school years. Mm. So um, that paired with ballet, paired with going to a school of the arts, a high school where I did, uh, I was in vocal and then I was in dance um, and my piano knowledge and all that kind of stuff. That all prepped me for this like random open call. Uh, Cats, the national tour came to town and they had mm. this big open call. And, uh, and so I went and uh, I happened to book the job straight out of high school. Oh, wow. So, um, so I basically just went with the flow and I went on tour and then they moved me to New York to Broadway. <laughs> and then I just was auditioning and booking whatever I could and doing whatever I could um, in New York, um, for a while. So I've been, you know, I've been on Broadway for 20 years now. Um, nice. yeah. And, uh, so it's a long career. <laughs> it's an interesting career. It's, it's uh, quite a varied <laughs> career by the sound of it. And it sounds like all of your earlier work just Broadway was inevitable by the sound of it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, I didn't know it at the time cause it wasn't like I didn't really know anything about Broadway, so I didn't know that that was a desire. You know <laughs> what I you mean? Were like smack I, deep in it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Then I was like, oh, oh, Broadway. Oh, Broadway. This is this is big. This is awesome. <laughs> Opening night on stage. Oh, I'm on Broadway. How did I get here? <laughs> yeah. Ah. Uh, so yeah, so yeah. Ah, I've I've completely lost the question I was going to ask, unfortunately. I know. <laughs> oh no, this is tragic. Um <laughs> Broadway, Broadway. Well, I mean, we can dive. We can dive into it. Um, it's yeah. 2014. You're starring in Hedwig and the Angry Inch. Yes, it's, it's doing very, very well. Uh, <laughs> in fact, it wins several Tony Awards. Mm -hmm. Talk me through that process. How did you? How did you get involved? Take me from the beginning of that play to that night at the Tonys. Um, if you would be so kind. Sure. So. Uh... At the time, I was in Kinky Boots on Broadway. I was um, one of the original cast members for that show. Uh, I originated the role of Nicola, which is a small but mighty role. And uh, you made it your own. <laughs> I did. I did. And um, I heard that Hedwig and the Angry Inch was coming to Broadway, starring Neil Patrick Harris. And I knew the show so well because it is one of my favorite shows of all time. Um, I had seen it when I was 19 uh, in the original off-Broadway production and uh, I fell in love with it. I got the soundtrack. Um, I knew the music back backwards and forwards. And so um, when I heard it was coming, I, I thought I have to be in it. Like I have to be in this. How am I going to be in this? Um, so while I was doing Kinky Boots, I auditioned and the audition process was very long and drawn out. And uh, um, and when I booked it, I was so happy. <laughs> I was going to say, I'm sure there was a lot of competition for that. It's, a, it's lots a of competition, big names yeah. attached to it. Any yeah. opportunity to play across from Neil Patrick Harris, everyone's going to be out for that. I, and you right. nailed and it. You got show. it. And then the show, I got it. And it, it's a very um, epic audition that I did. Uh, it's very, it's very famous in the Broadway community for me. Oh. Completely outlandish. Yeah. Oh, please, please <laughs> do do go on. So um, right before my final callback, um, the creator of the show came to me, John Cameron Mitchell, and he said, 
All right. And when you come back for your final callback, I want you to come into the room as Yitzhak, that's the character, and leave the room as Yitzhak. And I never want you, and I want you to never drop character in the room. And I was like, okay. And he said, we're going to do some improv. We, the people, the creative team, we're going to ask you questions. Um, we want you to tell a story or tell a joke in character. You're going to do all this stuff. And um, just a list of long like songs and all this kind of stuff they wanted me to do. And I was like, okay. So I went home and I thought they want me to tell a joke in character. What the hell am I going to do? <laughs> and then I thought, wait, this is also kind of, it can't be so meta. You know, I, as Yitzhak, why am I coming to this audition? I can't be coming to audition to play myself for the show. That gets so, kind of inception -y, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 I have to figure out a way to, um justify why I'm in the room like why would I be in an audition room or in a room like that you know sure. what am I trying to do and so I came up with this monologue um this whole backstory about my character growing up in um uh, in communist um <laughs> sorry yeah in communist Croatia <laughs> and um on a yak farm <laughs> That was the sole <laughs> producer of the yak hair for the cat for the wigs and cats. So all the wigs and cats are made out of yak hair. And I thought, well, what if I was like, what if Yitzhak is from a farm, a yak hair farm in you know communist Croatia? And that's how he knows about musical theater is because that's what they do. They produce the yak hair for the wigs. And, uh, and so I, I made up this whole, um, this is on my YouTube page, by the way. So if you are at all curious about this, you can go to my YouTube page. Um, and then there's a video. Um, anyway, so, oh, so the whole reason I'll finish the story. The whole reason I was there in the room in the first place was I was trying to get these people who I'd imagined were producers to donate to um, my Kickstarter campaign in order to bring rent back to Broadway so I could star as Angel. That was the whole deal. And so after I did my entire monologue, which was a good three minutes, I brought out um, a computer. I opened the computer up and I played a two and a half minute Kickstarter campaign <laughs> video for them in wow. character, the whole thing all over New York. And that that's what's on YouTube. So. That's on my YouTube. You can watch that. The monologue is also written underneath. And, um, and uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to have to go and check that, start, check yeah. that out. For this, and that's... So I, I got the job. Now, the Obviously. Answer... How could they not give you the job after all of that? <laughs> I mean, damn. No one else surely put in that level of effort. Yeah. It was like, wow. Wow. She put the most effort in so she should get the job. I just wanted to make it nearly impossible for them to say no. And, it, sure. and I did. Um, and uh, I mean, you know, it does that for an audition, but I knew the show and I knew kind of, I knew how wild the show is and how out there and how creative it is. And I knew I could just go for it and um, they would really appreciate it. And they did. So that's kind of the famous audition. Um, gone down in Broadway in, legend. Gone down in Broadway legend history. Someone once said that they show it. <laughs> oh, the casting director who actually cast it. They said they show it at their, um, when they do master classes, <laughs> as they show the whole audition. I was like, you have the whole audition on tape? I want that. <laughs> um, <laughs> they show the whole audition as like the perfect audition, which I think, is is telling people the wrong thing oh. <laughs> yeah it was the perfect audition for maybe that show but it is not the perfect audition for any other show other than that plus it kind of puts the bar pretty high what do you do to top that when you want to book your next gig exactly How can you possibly exceed that i haven't been able to put that much effort into an audition <laughs> since like i'm just like ah I, re I mean, I really went for it that time. Anyway, so so yeah, so I get the job. I leave Kinky Boots. I join um, Hedwig. We rehearse, and the whole time I'm thinking, I, I'm I'm thinking, oh, Neil's great. Neil's amazing. I'm just sitting in the dark the whole time. <laughs> and so while we're we're in rehearsals, I I'm just going up to the director and to Neil and I'm kind of listening to their conversations. And usually they're having conversations about like, how do we get rid of this microphone or how do we get this stand or how do we this, how do we that? And I was always there going, I'll do it. <laughs> I'm not doing anything. 
I'll do it. So, um, <laughs> so basically I like inserted myself into the show as much as I could just by being kind of like, you know, just by listening. Um, and Not taking uh, advantage of the opportunities as they, and, as they yeah, arise. And just being kind of there for, for them to use as just whatever, as a prop. Um, and so, uh, so, and also a sound person, I essentially learned how to run sound on stage. No kidding. <laughs> yeah. If a mic, because the show is fully just, uh, it's like 95, hundred minutes nonstop. So there's no, um, break, there's no intermission and the characters never leave stage. Mm. So if, if a microphone breaks or anything goes wrong, you know, then it, it was up to me to change the mic out, to um, switch stands if it broke, to do all kinds of things on stage. So I was basically the on stage, like, sound person for real. <laughs> did you Not have only... to use those skills? I mean, how often did yeah. that situation come up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stands broke all the time. Sometimes depended on the, it depended on the headwig, but sometimes... There was a bigger head, like a strong head wig, and he'd break the mic in half, and I'd oh, have no. to find another wireless mic. You know, like um, so. Yeah, it just depended on the on the uh, on the head wig how how often I would have to switch switch out gear. But I did have to switch out gear quite a bit. I'm just imagining um, you coming into work, being like, "Oh, okay, it's being played by them today, right? <laughs> I need to get my stuff ready. I need to be ready to go. It have the wild. extra mic on hand." Yeah. It was wild. It was a lot of, um, it was a lot of responsibility. And, um, I was someone who could communicate directly with the sound people off stage. Mm. So they were always telling me kind of like what to do. Um, but it was fun because it kept me really engaged in the show. So all during the show, I am like, I have, I have to be laser focused because I'm sitting there on stage and even though I'm sitting in the dark, I had to be like laser focused just in case something went wrong mm -hmm. and at any time anything could go wrong. And not only that, head, the person playing Hedwig was always allowed to just go off script. So at any point they could have come to me and said something or thrown something my way, you know, so I had to really stay um, engaged and that was really helpful for the character. Um, so when we opened and did our first preview, it was interesting because people, they couldn't find me on stage because they didn't recognize me because I looked so much like a man. And the only, and the only real time that they figured out that it, I was actually a, a woman was when way later in the show was when I sang um, Whitney Houston, I will always love you. And, uh, and that was usually when people were like, oh, that's a girl. Because <laughs> I played a man. Nice, nice. And, uh, and so even my parents were, couldn't find me um, on the stage until, a little, until I like, opened my mouth. And then they recognized my voice. Um, but I thought there was no way I would be nominated for a Tony Award. Um, because I had very little dialogue. Almost none. And um, one song and the rest I was back up and always in the dark, like always in the dark. <laughs> but you did it with gusto. You sat in the dark, the the dark with real panache. <laughs> yeah, I thought I thought there was no way. Um, and then I got a nomination and I was like, oh, like, holy shit, you know, um, whoa, like that's crazy. And then uh, and then we started doing, you know, press for, um, the Tony awards. Uh, and what's funny is I need to backtrack a minute. This is, this is all rolling into why we're here. So in, in 20, let's see, in 2012, um, I was, I was in kinky boots and, um, I also had this rock band called the deafening and, um, I was kind of burning the candle at both ends. Uh, same with, I was doing the same when I was in Hedwig, but I was still burning the candle at both ends um, back eight then. Eight shows a week, right? Eight shows a week, plus shows with my band, plus like partying, like all <laughs> kinds of stuff. And so I would wake up in the morning and um, sometimes I would be so hungover. Um, the only thing I wanted to do was I wanted to watch something that would make me happy, right? And so I was looking one day on Netflix, I was looking for something that would make me happy because I was felt like shit. And, uh, 
and and my little pony friendship is magic popped up and i said what's this <laughs> i was like i remember the original my little pony but i remember it being dark and weird and this looks like fun like the colors it looks so like it just looks right it is actually friendly. bright yeah yeah you it looks really it's happy like, yeah yeah and uh, i thought i guess i'll watch this and it was three there were three full seasons that i could stream on netflix hmm. And um, I started episode one, season one, and I was hooked. Like, immediately, I was like, oh, man, this is awesome. <laughs> I was like, I love this. Like, I was like, the songs are so good. And I can hear all the influences, you know, from yeah, the composer. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the composer, Daniel Ingram, I could hear all his influences when he was writing all the songs. I loved all the personalities of all the different ponies and, um, and I loved their adventures and I, and I loved the kind of overall, the overall uh, message I got from the show, which was mm. that, you know, friends are very important there. And I didn't really have a ton of friends. I had kind of, I kind of shut myself off from everyone at that point, just because I was completely overdoing it with work or the band or whatever. Mm. And I wasn't like bringing people other than my band or my boy, you know, into my life, I'd kind of oh. completely shut down from the rest of the world. And I was like, you know what? I got to call my friends. And, um, it was then that I had reconnected with my best friend from when I was 11 years old. We had grown up, we were best friends all the way until we graduated high school. And then I went off and, you know, and then we lost touch and, uh, we rekindled our friendship and that was really special to me. So Anyway, so I binge watched all three seasons and, um, and then, uh, Hedwig was happening during the fourth season. Right. And, um, and I remember when I was nominated for, um, a Tony award, it was the end of the fourth season. And that was the fourth season. The last two episodes, it was a two parter for the finale. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll never, I'll never forget it. And so during the Tony Awards season, when we're doing all this press, I was super into My Little Pony because I was like, season four, it is so good. <laughs> <laughs> and I was telling all these interviewers. But I mean, you like, get passionate about a, a, a show and you get into it. That's of course yeah, what you're doing. Yeah. Oh. And so, you know, all these interviewers are talking to me, asking me like, you know, what are you into right now? And I'm like, my little pony friendship is magic. And my bubbles, this was just like, you gotta stop. <laughs> I was like, yeah. And the funny thing is, is that um, there's this Vanity Fair article right. that I did um, for the Tony Awards. And what was funny is before the interview, I was talking to the woman who was, who was gonna interview me. I was talking to her about the season finale <laughs> of season four. Not about Hedwig, not about, you know, all the other, now, not about Kinky Boots. It had about just, Tony. Yeah, it had just, I had just watched it. And um, I had just watched it and I was like super stoked about it. <laughs> I was telling her about this like explosion of rainbows and like all this stuff. And uh, she put it in the Vanity Fair article. So That's you can, yeah, yeah. So My Little Pony, it's in the Vanity Fair article. It's pretty funny. Um, anyway, <laughs> so, so my, my publicist, um, right before the Tony Awards, she said, because I was trying to write my speech. Sure. And I didn't think I was going to win. Again, the women I was against were amazing. They had a hell of a lot more than I did to do on stage. And I just thought, there's just no way I'm going to win. I, I say nothing. I, I, I'm in the dark <laughs> all the time. <laughs> there's no way. And, um, and, uh, and so I didn't really write out a speech. I just wrote down some names and I had written something cute, um, or like a little heartfelt paragraph or whatever. And I stuffed it in my dress and, uh, my, my, my uh, publicist basically was like, if you win, do not mention My Little Pony, okay? <laughs> I was like, all right, <laughs> I didn't think I was going to win. Um, and when I did actually win, um, I was, couldn't believe it. And uh, I walked up on stage and um, I had the two pieces of paper that I pulled out of my <laughs> bra. Where else are you going to keep them? 
on live TV. Right. Um, yeah. And unfolded them and I read everything off. And at the very end, because you only get 90 seconds from when they call your name to when they boot you off stage. Mm. So it was like, you got to go fast. You got to go fast. So it's a really frantic, absurd speech. And <laughs> I don't know, you know, I, I could have done so much more with my time than what I did. But you could the have thing, mentioned the yak farming. <laughs> I could have mentioned yak farming. Yeah. And But instead, I was just wildly, you know, just reading names and sure. trying to get everything out. Kind of in I shock said. at that point. Yeah, exactly. And um, and then uh, and then at, at the end, right after I said my little little paragraph, I thought, oh, "Friendship is magic." <laughs> That's it. That's what I can say because it doesn't say My Little Pony, but also <laughs> those who are in the know will know. And uh, and so yeah, so I finished my Tony speech with. Friendship is magic. And the Boom. internet exploded. And the internet went crazy because the bronies, they were like, does she mean, is she a fan? Was that for us? Like, and that what was, was that? The fandom was was still on the peaking uh, side yeah. of things at that point. It was still <laughs> yeah. huge. And I remember the, the, the uproar over that, Equestria Daily and... <laughs> Twitter, everyone was just going nuts because it was yeah. any any celebrity who expressed even the, the slightest interest in the show was like, oh, ooh, they're one of us, they're one of us, yes! And we got X, Y, and Z, awesome. <laughs> exactly. Um, it's funny because um, friends of mine were in the press room, the, the post-press room, you know, you go to the oh, press right. room after you win and they ask you questions and you answer them and... And I went there and I answered the questions and they said, so was Friendship is Magic um, a reference to My Little Pony? And I was like, yes. So. <laughs> and your publicist is in the back somewhere. So, like, oh, God. so, uh, so basically that was the confirmation for mm. the whole fandom, for Hasbro, for everyone. Well, thank you for that, by the way. Of course. And uh and uh, Hasbro then reached out and sent me like a huge box full of plushies nice. and all kinds of toys, which was awesome. As well, they should. I mean, they just got free publicity at the Tonys. <laughs> exactly. And then, um, and then it was wild because then they reached out and they said, "Hey, w would you want to be on the show? Would?" Can you know? Would you be interested in us writing you your own episode? And I was like, No, oh. not really. I was yeah. like, Oh my god, yes! <laughs> like, who? When does that ever happen? That someone who is a huge fan of something actually mm. gets to be in that thing, and it's something that is that far out of reach as like an actual My Little Pony episode because it is so insular. Mm. You know, it's. Um, it's not like you can go in as a per as a human and be like, "I'm auditioning for My Little Pony." Like that doesn't happen. No, it's a small you know, group the, of performers in mainly in Vancouver. Obviously, you've got Tara yeah. in LA, but Vancouver, it's quite it's a tight knit. It's like Broadway. It's a very tight knit community, and it's a little bit very. Hard to, it's really hard to get into. I can't even get into it. Um, <laughs> I only got in because I mentioned it on the Tony Awards. And but not, other than not, that, I was a bit part. They they wrote the part for you. They wrote the episode for you. Yeah, they wrote the episode for me. So, I mean, when they said, "Do you want your, you know, do you want your own pony? Can we write you your own, your own episode?" I was like, "Yes, yes, yes." And then when I found out that it was, um, uh, Amy. it was Amy's. Yeah, it was Amy's last um, episode that she was writing, and it felt even more special. And then when I heard the songs Daniel wrote, it felt even more special. And then when they told me about the storyline and then they showed me the pony that they drew me and like the, I, I was just like it was really cool because um a lot of thought went into it and i uh, i spoke with amy a little bit earlier actually and i know she's going to be around for uh the pony feud a little bit later this evening but she was talking <laughs> she was saying how excited she was when she learned that she was writing a part for you and how that even psyched her out a little bit because she was wanting to make it the best possible. It wasn't enough pressure from it being her final episode. It's like, oh, right. okay. oh no, I've got to, got to write a part <laughs> for Lena. I've got to make it extra amazing. So I know was, she was absolutely thrilled to have you involved. Yeah, it was really cool because it it felt, it just felt beyond special. And it was kind of like, 
it was a moment in time that I'll never, ever forget, you know, even recording it and listening to everyone who I had list, like who had watched as ponies um, on the screen. And then um, because I didn't actually get to go record it in Vancouver, I was, right. I had to record it in, in New York. Um, so I heard everyone just over my headphones and I, and I could just recognize all the characters. So it was wild. It was like imagining being in a room with actual ponies. It was, it was crazy. Um, it's not so much that you're recording sick. with Andrea Lemon. You're, you're recording with Fluttershy at that point. Yeah, exactly. You're hanging out with the characters. Exactly. That was sure. exactly it. And that was, that was super cool. Um, and uh, yeah, and even watching it with my niece um, when it aired, that you was- You live streamed that, as I recall. I live streamed that. I live streamed it on Periscope thinking it was gonna disappear because I looked like absolute shit. Oh. And, uh, and someone pulled it and put it up. I was like, oh no, <laughs> <laughs> I should have put some makeup on. <laughs> <laughs> the internet is forever. Yeah, exactly, the internet is forever <laughs> so is it true that you were uh, you recorded your your songs and you had you were having bronchitis you had some uh, some throat issues you had to do them again I did yeah I had bronchitis the first time around and I was getting really bad chronic bron uh, bronchitis at the time and um and uh and so the first go around wasn't great and then when we did it the second time it was great so you know it was just um health issue mm. <laughs> but i still sang it and it still sounded good that's the thing it just sounded uh really gruff and not sure. quite like my speaking voice had been recorded the gruffness my... didn't quite fit the character yeah the 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 way my speaking voice was didn't fit the way the song sounded uh, because there was that kind of deep sound that was like you know like when you have bronchitis you sound kind of more gruff I guess <laughs> I don't know <laughs> but yeah sounds, I had to record them twice it sounds like the episode as well kind of has some parallels in real life and not so much the colorful ponies but the reconnecting with an old friend you mentioned earlier that you had had that experience did that have any uh, impact on the way you played the character um, yeah, I'm, I, at the time I, and I always think this, I always feel like, um, my, well, actually it's my art imitates my life because it's usually I've lived it first and then I'll play it later, um, in some way or another hmm. and, or I'll play it around the same time. So it's all kind of happening, happening like simultaneously. And, um, uh, with friendship is with, with that show it was very much like, uh, like, um, kind of like, an yeah, like reconnecting with my friends, finding the people who really were on my side and, um, and kind of shedding those who were just using me or weren't there for me when I needed them or were there for me only when, I want to do bad thing, you know, like mm. people who, who weren't actually supportive. Um, I definitely went through a big change in my life where, um, I, I had changed my lifestyle. I changed, um, how I ate. I changed kind of, I was going to therapy and like all that kind of stuff. And, um, and also, you know, stop drinking and, um, and it was interesting to see the people who were not supportive of my not drinking, who kept trying to get me to drink again. And I was like, these people aren't, you know, aren't good to have in my life. Respecting. They're not. Yeah. They just, they just want to use that part of me. So, um, so yeah, I had gotten rid of a bunch of the bad and, um, and brought along um, the new or the, the old who were supportive who I'd lost touch with. It really was an episode for you. Yep. About you. Uh, <laughs> so as we're on the pony stuff, uh, the pony topic, I'm now just looking through the Discord. We've had a lot of questions in from people, a lot of people expressing their appreciation for your work on the episode. Yeah. Ah. Thank you. Oh, here's, an, here's a nice one. Um, 
they would like to know if you've kept up with the show, if you continued watching it uh, past season four and season five, and if you, in fact, knew that your character had a little cameo, non-speaking, but was visible in the, the series finale. She was? No, yes. I didn't know that. And that's cool. I know, I, I, for the longest time, I was trying to get them to bring me back because I really wanted to come back and do more because um, I had so much fun. And I, I personally love doing voiceover. I want to do it more. I want to do more cartoon, more voiceover work like that because it is something that just brings me utter joy. And, um, and they were never really responsive. <laughs> and uh, the movie... They had told me I was going to be in the movie, um, but as a different pony that I was going to voice a different, well, a different character in the movie. Sure. And then something happened and they got more, they got people who are much more famous mm. um, instead. And that really broke my heart. So I'm that kind of, um, I, I loved my episode. And, and then after that, I kind of, I've stopped, I stopped watching it um, as I just stopped watching it as much because um, I don't know. It was like being on the show. Um, that was like the ultimate, like how could it get any better oh, than that? Yeah. And, uh, and then also the whole thing with um, Hasbro in the movie and being kind of passed over for really, really famous people. And then they, the thing is, is that they didn't tell me, um, so I just, I thought I was going to be doing it. And then, oh. um, and then I found out later that I wasn't. So they should that, have taken that, a lesson from their own property there about, you know, being honest and straightforward with people. Yeah. We, I wish they had just been straightforward with me, but they didn't. Um, and that, that sucked. It, oh, it just yeah. was like months and months and months until they actually told me what was going on. Well, thank you for still being willing to talk about all of this that period in your life and it sounds like you did of course pull a great deal from it I'm, mm. I'm sitting here thinking about how much your story parallels a lot of the experiences of people getting into the fandom they, they weren't expecting to love the show as much as they did <laughs> they watched it it happened to come along at just that right moment in their lives and mm -hmm. things explode from there but a lot of people have had that and sort of drifted away because they've taken everything they could from the show but they can always sort of reflect fondly on the memories they'll always have ponyville if you like yeah i mean there i was playing the game a lot uh, which i loved and the um, the phone game the phone game yeah right. and uh, my character was on the phone game and i was like oh my god <laughs> like that I was just you're playing like, yourself on your phone I I know, yeah. So things like that were really cool. And um, I just didn't know why they didn't reach out and keep having me do voices for her um, in other in other venues. Um, I did see that um, in Equestria Girls, she made, uh, my character made an appearance. Oh, fabulous. And I was like, oh, that'd be so cool to be on like, an, like to be in Equestria Girls. But um, I'm not quite sure what's going to happen, but, um, but again, I, I would always love to, I, I never have like really hard feelings, you know, um, sure. uh, that sucked, but at the same time, it's like, I would love to, it, it's such a dream of mine to just be a recurring, um, or a main cartoon character in a mm -hmm. show and just, and, and do voiceover like that. Um, cause they're Gen really, five. we've got to bring you back for Gen five. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, for me, it, it, it's the singing and vocal, vocal, like performance or acting. Like I, it, there's something that is so fulfilling there. I just love it so much. So the dream. Well, speaking, <laughs> of, speaking of loving music and performance, there's a question here, uh, as to which particular song in your episode you preferred. Spectacle or the magic inside slash I am just a pony. Which which of those two? I mean, I loved all the songs were so good. Um, but honestly, I really liked the spectacle because it is it was so bang on, na like nailed on the head, like pop, bad pop. Like it was so good, and I just I loved performing that one. That one was really fun to perform because it, it was. Yeah, it was more like um, parody and less and less like actually just me singing. Um, 
which was the magic inside was just like me singing um, and you know, me emotionally singing. Sure. But the other one was like, oh, I get to parody like um, a pop star. I get to parody like Lady Gaga, you know, how cool is that? Uh, so I really liked that one. I thought the energy was awesome. And I loved what they did with the background dancers. <laughs> <laughs> I just die every time I see it. I watch that. I watch that every once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> ah, um, speaking of those songs, another question here. Uh, wanting to know what you, how you feel about the remixes that so many talented musicians in the fandom have done. Have you heard any of the the remixed versions or the versions that have been inspired by by your performances? How do you feel? About I that? have, yeah, I love that. I think that is so cool. I've heard some awesome ones. Um, that's something that's like really cool about the fandom is that it brings out everyone's creative side. And um, there's so many incredibly talented musicians and, I mean, illustrator, like, there's all kinds of, I mean, the, the, the range of talent from this fandom is huge. And, uh, and the music side of it, I think, is so cool because it, it makes sense because all of the music in the show is really good mm. um and daniel ingram did an amazing job with the music so to me it makes sense that it would attract um these musicians and sure. uh to make such really cool like you know i heard like one that was super techno -y and like i just heard really cool uh remixes and i always appreciate them a lot did, did you get a chance to make it to uh to brony palooza at brony 2018 no ah uh, alas <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've got we've got a question here uh, asking about uh, any other sort of shows or cartoons in particular that you were a huge fan of back in the day, or what are you what are you currently watching? What's your current go to Netflix binge show? Oh God, currently what am I? Want? Well, currently, <laughs> I don't know if you guys remember Beyond Belief <laughs> with, with um, Jonathan Frakes. <laughs> Have you, have you, you've you've seen the video of him speaking at half speed, right? <laughs> no, no. no. Uh, there is a video circulating of of him speaking at half speed with the the description that he sounds like a, a drunk at like a bus station, sort of trying to. <laughs> when was the last time you had a plumber in your house? How much would you be? How much would you accept to spend the night in a haunted house? It's it's. Look for it. It's bloody hilarious. I love that. There's also one they did a compilation of just all of his like, how would you and what does this look like? And did you go to this? It's so funny. But I like watching them because they, I don't know, they're just funny. They're, to me, every single one of them, I laugh so hard. Um, just because it's wild. It was such a moment in time. I, that is kind of what I discovered. And But I haven't been really watching any TV. I haven't been able to sit and really focus. Um, on anything uh other than like home improvement projects <laughs> but for me like trying to watch anything um has been pretty difficult um so usually i'll like throw hgtv on in the background and i'll do a home improvement project i'm pretty it's boring i'm sorry <laughs> nah, not at all not at all i mean you've got the time and you, you can do the work why not do it yourself <laughs> uh <-huh>. um, <laughs> very so capable so back in the day, cartoons, what else were you into? You said you watched some <gasps> of the original Pony. Oh, yeah. I watched the original Pony, Gem, and the Holograms. Um, I was super into Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Nice. Um, I love Transformers, She-Ra, He-Man. Um, I'm dating myself. Uh, yeah. And, oh, Batman Returns. What a great show. Right. Dark, good, really good. Um, yeah, classics. those were the ones that... The classic. I, I remember I watched Care Bears and um, uh, what's the one? Oh, it was not. Yeah, Strawberry Shortcake, but it was Rainbow Bright. Oh, was right. it Ra Rainbow Bright? Yeah, right. didn't Rainbow Bright? Yeah, Rainbow Bright had a cartoon. I, I think all of them had had all of the the toy lines in the eighties had cartoons. Yeah, exactly. But uh, my favorite were definitely Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and. Um, Transformers, G.I. Joe. I like kind of the boy ones more. <laughs> well, I mean, a, a ton of boys like Pony, so 
why be up. constrained by the by the traditional gender of the audience and so forth right yeah <laughs> uh, question here about um, the design of your character. Did you have input in that? It sounds like you had input into a lot of that episode. Did you, did you get to choose your own cutie mark, that kind of thing? Um, I didn't choose my own cutie mark, uh, but I did. they did fashion the pony off of me, um, off of a red carpet look that they found where my hair is actually um, blue and dark. Uh, so I had like ombre hair, um, that time. And so they kind of like made the pony look like that, you know, specifically, I was just like, cool. <laughs> <laughs> like, what am I, what, you know, what kind of like, I'm, I just thought it was really cool. I liked the star with the music notes and that it like shimmered and I thought it was just so cool. So it is a beautiful design. Really beautiful. And I liked her costumes. <laughs> I like I, re <laughs> I like really liked the costume that she wears right before she sings the magic inside. It's like it was like some wild like she's wearing all this stuff. I loved it. All these gems. I thought she looked great. <laughs> you, you need a copy of that. I mean, we've got so many talented people in the fandom. We need to find someone who can make that for you. And you can cosplay as yourself. As myself. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, we've got the perennial favorite questions, um, literally, you know, favorite pony, favorite villain, favorite episode, all of that. If you want to, if you want to dive into those. Uh, ooh, uh, ra uh, rarity, favorite pony, faux show. Good choice. What's the freaking she, it, it, the, oh, uh, Manhattan. Made in the, the, yes, sorry. Oh, now I'm flaking on the name. No, ha. <sighs> Uh, that one that yes, is that one that one <laughs> that said that was my favorite show best songs it was all about rarity it made, uh, she was uh she was doing the fashion show right yes i love that one i love that one and what's the song stitching it together it, the that was uh season one that was another amy episode i believe that was out of the dress yes ah and loved those loved that song that Which song like pure song time isn't it pure like complete and utter uh it's so good um so yeah so definitely rarity <laughs> obviously <laughs> i also really liked the al yankovic one i thought it was like She's wild Sandwich and pinkie pie yeah i thought it was wild and bizarre and i love pinkie pie of course but rarity just reminds me of my sister so much that in the good ways or the bad both the good ways and the bad ways in the both ways <laughs> <Gotcha>. <laughs> Ah, oh, uh, a person in the chat called Notewise says they will let you know if you make a cameo in the season 10 comics, because the, the comic books are apparently kind of continuing the continuity of the show. So who knows? Ooh, might be a, cool. A there. Nice. Browsing through. And again, to the, the folks asking questions, thank you so much for all of your wonderful questions. I'm obviously not going to be able to answer all of them. I beg your pardon. Why would I answer them? <laughs> nah, I'm not going to be able to ask all of them. <laughs> um, but... I'm gonna try and ask as many of them as I can. And if they have uh, if they have ones that aren't answered by you, uh, do you mind them? I mean, how, how can people how can people follow your work? Instagram, Twitter? Yeah, on all social media, I'm at Lena Rocker Hall. So L-E-N-A Rocker, R-O-C-K-E-R, Hall, H-A-L-L. -L. <laughs> and that, you know, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, um, you can reach out and um, you can DM me. Um, sometimes, usually I see them, um, sometimes I don't, but usually I can get to them. Um, also, uh, if you at me on like Twitter or, yeah, if you at me on Twitter, I will usually see it or respond hoofsies hoofsies <laughs> um the episode we're being told uh is uh, rarity takes man no no that rarity takes manhattan yes the name of that episode there we go so um let's pivot a little bit from pony although you know fabulous and i'm sure we could talk about <laughs> it for, for ages but you you have another show coming out very very soon not yep. quite the same genre not quite as, as <laughs> based on friendship and, you know, niceness. Um, right. <laughs> dystopian, because, you know, what, what, what else do we need right now in our dystopian world than a dystopia? But you're, you're in Snowpiercer, coming out next yeah. month. Yeah, a whole other fandom, too. So yes. they, What's that been like? Long, it's been a long process. I mean, we filmed the original pilot at the end of 2017. 
Right. And uh, the show was picked up and then all these changes were made. And even I was changed from one character named Sayori and I was moved into the character that I am now called Miss Audrey. And they did that because um, they basically, they looked me up. (laughs) They said, who do we have in our cast? And they looked me up and they, they were just like, she should be, you know, the madam of the night car, the cabaret singer, like that's what she should be before I was kind of the, I was the archivist of the train. Mm. I was also really a kind of evil person. (laughs) Um, And uh, they just looked at my, you know, the stuff I had online and they, they kind of looked me up and they just tailor made this, this role for me. So, um, that's got to be pretty exciting. Again, uh, having a role yeah. that fits you and your your talents perfectly. Exactly. And um, I was really excited that they did that. And we didn't get to start filming actual season one until the end of 2018. Hmm. And so uh, we finished filming season one and it was going to air. Uh, they were saying it was going to air um, in, two, in 2019. And then they said, no, we're going to wait. <laughs> Interesting. And they are they but they renewed us for season two and um i already have filmed eight episodes in season two but we had to stop right right. um mid nine ten uh mid filming nine ten um because of everything that's happening in the world right now and um yeah totally understandable that's fine and then uh they just uh put pulled the the um the episode air date earlier. So it was supposed to air on the 31st of May and now it's airing on May 17th. So they can't make up their mind, can they with the air date? <laughs> yeah. Um, but they really love the show. They really believe in it. You know, there's this new streaming service called HBO max. I know that this is a part of that um, company. And, and so I know that they were trying to get all their ducks in a row so that this show could be as successful as possible. And I really hope, it is successful. I love my character. I love, you know, I love the show. I think it's, I don't know if you guys have read the comics. Um, there's From the these, 80s, right? Yeah, they're graphic novels and they are so good. It's very dark, um, but like so good, way ahead of its time. Uh, and the Bong film is awesome, but it's just one small kind of storyline that can happen. Mm. And so our show is a much more expanded idea and also um, takes place earlier than the Bong film. And, um, and if do yourself a favor, read the graphic novels. They are so good. Having 10 hours versus two and having the episodic format, I'm sure you can do a much deeper dive into that world. And if it's you know, as rich as you're describing from the graphic novels, then that's, that's a yeah. real privilege to be a part of that. Yeah. Yeah. There's so much you can do with the graphic novels. I mean, it seems like there's not, it seems like there's not a ton that can happen because of um, you're stuck on a train. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But believe me, there is a lot that can go on. Uh, And, uh, and Bond's film is cool because it actually takes you from the tail and you get to discover the entire train um, moving forward with your main character. So you just go with that main character all the way to the front, back to front. And with us, you actually get to see everything you know, kind of happening at the same time. So you really get to dive deep into the different classes of the train and, you know, the, the different personalities and, and what's happening seven years in um, to this basic quarantine that they have going on. I was going to say, it's, it's a perfect show for kind of self-isolation and social distancing, isn't it? <laughs> very, very, buzz- it's wild. I can't believe it, but... It is, it is really cool. And you're working with, uh, with another uh, Broadway legend, if I may use the word. Um, David Dix is yeah, on the yeah. show. Had you worked with him at all uh, prior to, to the show? No, no, unfortunately. Um, I hadn't gotten a chance to work with him, although I did know him. And, um, but now, and I knew him from the Hamilton crew. And, um, man, all those people are just so awesome. And uh, David is one of the best guys I've ever met and like just heart of gold and like so fun to work with we laugh we laugh so hard all the time um so I mean it's it's a drama obviously there's not any laughter on (laughs) it's not a comedy 
comedy. But you know, if if it was just a you know, if it was the cast and we were just doing our thing that we do, you know, that wasn't written, it would be a total comedy because we just we we uh, we laugh so much on set. And I really I do miss everyone, and I I'm sad we didn't get to finish season two, but we will get to we will get to finish it in the future. And I'm hoping it's a success so we can do a season three. Fingers crossed. And everyone yeah. watching, subscribe to the appropriate st- there, streaming services and make it a success. Watch the show. Snowpiercer. Yeah, May, yeah. May 17th? May 17th. May it's going to air on TNT um, at first. So I know they're doing a, the weekly rollout normally on TNT um, in the States. And apparently worldwide, it will air on Netflix. And I'm not sure when that's airing. They haven't given us a specific date when those will roll out. Um, but I do know that it will be on Netflix as well because Netflix is one of our producers. Gotcha. Yeah, so it's going to be worldwide. It's even going to be in China. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's exciting I'm, being a part of something. I mean, you've been a part of, of projects that have had a, a huge audience, but this seems mm-hmm. like it's taking it to an even higher level. Yeah, huge, huge, you know, um, uh, reach and audience. And uh, like, I'm hoping, I don't know, because uh, this has been such a, ongoing project for me and I haven't been able to do much else uh because this has just taken up all my time um because of when the when it films it's like it doesn't it films at the same time as a Broadway show would start so they overlap so I can't do both I have to do one or the other so I had to do this and um and it's 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 tough because I love performing live so much um but this is a dream of mine um to do TV like this, it's been a dream of mine. So, you know, it's kind of like, it's, it's, it's kind of like, I, I've always wanted to do this, but I do miss performing live, oh. <laughs> like so bad. But what's it's a new, the, it's a new venue. <laughs> what's the appeal, if I may ask? Why, why has it been a dream of yours for, for such a long time? And that, can we dive into that kind of different dynamic between live performance and TV? What, what? What do you get out of each, each kind of, each style of performance? Well, um, for performing live, you have an intimate connection with the audience right there. Um, you tell a story from start to finish. You, uh, you have, um, a for you have another character in the room, which is the audience. So you have their response kind of informing what you do. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, and so it's a real, you know, real time kind of, kind of thing going on and back and forth, the energy, you get a lot of adrenaline from performing live. Like it's a total adrenaline rush. And I I guess I'm an adrenaline junkie if you (laughs) were for real, but, um, but uh, it is over and it will never be recreated. And unless someone filmed a bootleg and usually the bootlegs aren't great quality, it will never exist again. Sure. Um, and every show is different. And um, there are so many times that I wish I could see what I had done live. And it ha- and even in a recording from video, it is never the same as when you get to sit and watch live. It's just not the same. Sure. You cannot, you cannot, ca- it's almost impossible to capture that. Whereas with TV film, it is built to be captured. So you've got a camera so close to your face. You can do a scene over and over again in order to perfect it. Um, The hard thing about it is that it doesn't go in chronological order. So you have to jump back and forth in time with Mm -hmm. your character where you are emotionally. Um, but at the end of the day, you have this beautiful piece of work that you can look at for the rest of time. And do you have the same uh, feeling towards sort of your music as well? I mean, performing it live versus having a, a record like the one that you just put out? Yeah. Segway I think, there. <laughs> <laughs> I think the, the uh, live performing is amazing. Um, I... I try to record my albums as close to a live performance as possible because um, for me, music is um, all about the live performance and all about the um, little imperfections that happen during the live performance. That is what makes it human. It's what makes 
um, it, it's what gives you the emotional connection to the song and to the performer. And I'm very much um, against, this is just my opinion, but I'm against all the overproduction of vocals where it's too perfect and it almost sounds, I mean, in, in my mind, I can, I, well, in my ear, I can hear, I can hear when vocals have been overproduced. Sure, um, too much like, too. Yeah, or, yeah, or even cut up into little pieces it's not a, it's not a performance. So right. the, the way I like to do my music is I like to give a performance, you know, sometimes we'll take a whole chunk here and a whole chunk there just because we liked those two, you know, those two parts of those tapes, but I will never like cut in and I will never, I, I try never to auto tune ever. Um, it's very raw, kind of like the magic inside. That was, is a very raw, um, performance of that song. I made sure that they didn't auto tune it. <laughs> yeah, and, and so much the better for that fact. And the, and the it has point to be that was raw the whole it doesn't work. Right. And that was the whole point of the episode, right? Is because she does um she does the glitz and glam and and it's all so auto tuned and overproduced. And then she does magic inside and it's raw and it's much more emotional. Um and there's so much more depth there, right? So that that has always been my style and uh and um I did it with the whole obsessed thing. Your YouTube series with your yeah, choice with, of favorite artists. Yeah. Um, and, you know, those were, we would do each song three or four times and then we would just take the best take. And then for, for, for video, they would take the video from whatever angles they got during each take. Sure. And, um, uh, but we filmed it and I recorded it. Um, the whole series, so all 54 songs, we recorded that in eight days because wow. I, I wanted to make sure that I didn't get too, you know, precious with everything, that I could just give a performance and move on, mm. you know, that's Force good. to do it within it, that, that small window of time. Exactly. Don't and, give yourself and space I, to get too comfortable with it. Yeah, don't give yourself space to get too um, critical, you know. So... Um, so yeah, so and that is the same with my new album that just came out, the Villa Satori, um, which is the name of the house I grew up in, by the way. Your little uh, the hippie and, house. Yeah, the hippie house. Yes. Um, that whole album was actually recorded live in a recording studio. Mm. So the band was in one room, and I was recording vocals in an ISO booth in another room. So we were doing it together at the same time. So that it has it has that same kind of sense of being electric and being live um and not things being kind of you know first the drums and then the bass sure. and the guitar and you know technical and yeah yeah and and i really you know i just appreciate that so much more now because it, it's a lot harder to find um it's and it's a lot harder to find an artist willing to just put themselves out like that um mm -hmm. I know you did a, a series of obsessed with some pink songs and pink is someone who comes to mind as someone who doesn't go the auto tune route, but yeah, exactly. Pure electric skill there. Yeah. She's, she is an amazing singer. She's also an amazing live singer. So I love her for that. You know, there's not a lot of, you know, huge pop stars that can pull off what they do on their albums mm. live. Um, well, dangling there, from, from <clears throat> silks. Right. Yeah, right, exactly. But there are a few people who can. You know, Lady Gaga is very, very talented. Taylor Swift's very talented. But, um, but there are a few that it's just like, you know, it's like, that doesn't sound like. <laughs> and you've got you've yeah. got a really eclectic mix of songs on this album and it's sort of an eclectic mix of artists that you, you covered for the Obsessed series you've got uh radiohead you've got jefferson airplane in there you've got the sex pistols you've got <laughs> pink you've got bowie outstanding um <laughs> where where can you talk a little bit about um when these these first came into your life and why you you chose to include them is there a, a particular artist um, or a particular song that <clears throat> you can talk about it your relationship to it um i would say it was it would be between Radiohead and Bowie because um, Radiohead was like my angsty teen years and and through when I left home to go do cats, you know, it was like I listened to Radiohead constantly. And um, and that was a huge influence on like my 
sadness, <laughs> melancholy, you know? Um, and those songs have always stuck in my head and always been kind of these, you know, this is markers of my life when I hear the song and I think, oh, I'm right back on that tour bus going through Montana. Like, you know, um, so for me, like Radiohead is just one of those artists that um, connect me to memory really, really strongly. And so is Bowie. Bowie is, um, is the same uh, also, but, uh, you know, again, very, very talented. They're very, very different. They're very um, off the beaten path in that they can write a popular song, but it is not a pop song. You know, sure. um, it's not a typical pop song. I guess pop means popular, but they you know push what I the mean? boundaries, it's, though. They're not afraid. <clears throat> to, to yeah, they're not afraid. And- well, they are themselves a hundred percent, and they just happen to write something that everybody connects with and loves and needs to hear over and over again. They're not trying to conform to anything. Sure. They are themselves, their own sound. David Bowie is a huge like inspiration for me. I just I love the genderless and the the hit the way he kind of played with the idea of him being almost an alien and mm. um he the changed that he his went out on as well black star and just put uh, him yeah. out into the world <clears throat> before he he, he, he passed yeah. was an amazing gift an amazing yeah way to, to leave behind the body of work that he did oh sorry no nah. no no exactly exactly and that's uh, again one of my you know and Ma- with, major influences so with songs like his um and the other artists you mentioned you may not sort of realize it at the time but those songs are kind of building a soundtrack to your life when you go back and hear them again it, uh, i know what you mean by snapping you back to that moment mm-hmm. yeah i have a very i'm so fascinated with with music and memory um the two I connect think... in a way that uh, sort of a lot of other art forms just don't quite have that that special connection. Yep, exactly. <laughs> we are getting one question quite a lot in in the chat here, and yes, it's, it's are you willing to perform for us? Are you willing to give us a song? Would that be okay? May I ask that? Uh, yeah, I can play something. I do have a. Um, I had to turn the brightness of my <laughs> light down because <laughs> because the sun's going down here. Um, I do have my guitar. You came prepared. And Thank you for that. I came prepared. I'm not a great guitar player. I'm just going to put that out there. Um, I do need to work on my guitar playing a lot. Uh, <laughs> so I will do my best. And can, can you hear the guitar? I, I think we can hear it. I can hear it. Hopefully the stream can hear it. Give us a couple of chords. Yeah, I can. Yep, that's coming through nicely. Nice. Okay, great. Well, uh, we were talking about Radiohead, so might as well play a Radiohead song. (laughs) Absolutely. Go for it, please. All right. Here we go. Please excuse me. (laughs) Um, um, This time, I feel my luck could change. Kill me, Sarah. Kill me again. With it's gonna be. Another state 
has called for me by name. I don't have time for this. It's gonna be a glorious day. Yeah, I feel my luck could change. much for that I, I of course the the reaction right now in the discord channel everyone is just has their lighters out there's a little emoji <laughs> for a, a yeah so people That's... people were loving that thank you so much awesome of course <laughs> so uh we've got a few more questions rolling in if you wouldn't mind uh, jumping around a little bit in topics unless there's anything else you would like to to share music wise no, no. Uh... All right. No, no, I mean, perfect. How do, you, you can't follow that. That's impossible to follow. That was fun. Thank you. If people do want to hear more of your wonderful music, they can, of course, buy your album. It's on yeah. Spotify. It's on iTunes. It's on, yeah. You can even TikTok it, yo. Oh, well, really? Uh, yeah. I don't know how to do that. I, this, is, this is officially the point where I know I've got old. It's, there's some social media thing and I don't understand it. TikTok, what is well, that? TikTok, yeah. Well, it's fun, um, but all my music is on TikTok. So, uh, but um, yeah, you can uh, stream my albums on on uh, Spotify. Uh, you can buy them on iTunes. Um, I'll have physical copies eventually because I know some people like collecting CDs. But um, but honestly, like um, stream it. <laughs> I wanted people to listen, and and I, I didn't necessarily need people to purchase. Um, because I know right now it's really hard for a lot of people, mm. um, money is tight and, uh, you know, we're all going through a lot and I wanted to share this and make sure that it was available for people to listen to, um, for free. And, you know, that's what is so great about Spotify sometimes is that, you know, it does make music very accessible to everyone. Um, and uh, yeah, so if you want, you can buy it, but um, I won't be mad if you stream it. <laughs> well, thank you very much for that. And yeah, now is absolutely the time when we need music to be angry to or be sad to, just something that we can use to get through this time, whatever helps. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I'm just going to scroll through my notes here and scroll through uh, my questions <laughs> from the audience. Again, thank you everyone who has sent in questions if I didn't get a chance to ask, not answer, if I didn't get a chance to ask the question, <laughs> um, by all means, uh, you've, you've said you're okay with answering them on Instagram and Twitter and so forth. Yeah, just reach out. Thank you for that. Oh, hmm. Do, 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 do. <laughs> oh, why not? Um, favorite Ninja <laughs> Turtle. That was a question that came up. Oh my God, Raphael! <laughs> Raphael fans represent. 
Yeah. <laughs> ah, do, 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 do. Oh, um, thoughts? Uh, another perennial favorite question really is thoughts on the fandom as a whole. I mean, coming into the show, you, you were a fan yourself, but how was that experience suddenly going from a fan of the show to being on the show and having people who are also fans of the show suddenly coming in and being fans of the show involving you. I'm not answering, answering, I can't talk. Okay, I'm gonna try, I'm gonna start that all over. I'm gonna stop, I'm coming, in, coming again, take two. What was it like, having been a fan of the show uh, and then coming onto the show, your experience as a fan of the show obviously changed. How did that influence your experience with then uh, interacting with the fandom when you were invited to cons and getting to see other fans who are now fans of you if they weren't before and if they weren't before they should have been. But anyway, what how, what was that like for you? Um, well, I thought that was if really there was cool. a question in there, I, I'm not sure. I, well, I mean, yeah, I, I, I knew about like, when I first started the show, I didn't know that there was a huge fandom already. Okay. And then after I watched the show on Netflix, a, a, a sh another a documentary was there called Bronies, right? Right. And the, so I the watched one that. Lancy did. Was that the one yeah, Lancy did or the I one Ashley Ball did? Uh, no. Nope. One no, them. it wasn't the Ashley Ball one. The okay. Ashley, I watched that one later. Okay. But um, it was the one that was like kind of a black and white cover with like the outlines of the pon pony. I think that's the Delancey one. Either one. You, you saw hey, a documentary. I saw, I saw a documentary about it and I was like really fascinated. I was like, oh my God, that's, it's kind of cool because this is like opened up a venue for a lot of people who are seeking um, like-minded people. And, um, and it's become a way for people to connect and make friends that they wouldn't have normally been able to meet or make friends you know or be friends with um any other way so uh so i thought it was really cool that it kind of opened that up and um the whole message of the show really felt like it was the fan like the fandom was the message of the show that friendship is really truly magic and it became this like guild of people who were friends and there for each other and um internalizing and, that, the core principle exactly and supporting each other and i i really loved that um and then uh yeah and and then i i remember i was calling myself a pega sister right because i was like <laughs> the girl you know the girl version oh, I'm a pega sister, I'm a pega i haven't sister. heard that one in a while <laughs> great <laughs> and then uh and then when my show aired or no it was actually before my show aired, um, before my episode aired, it was um, after I had won the Tony Award. Mm. That's when people were coming out to like see my band or see me in the show or like they were coming out to support me and what I do. And I always felt, you know, like really, really happy to meet them, happy to, um, they would always give me, you know, plushies and things like that. And I thought it was so generous, you know, like, like beyond generous um uh, it's a very it is a very generous fan base it is a very generous fandom absolutely i've never gotten more um uh more fan art or you know uh more you know toys and things like that and um i got this set of really cool towels once that someone had hand embroidered oh, wow. um with the each day of the week with the um, ponies and i was just like this is so cool you know yeah, you talked about um, the level of creativity and talent in in the fandom it's very much expressed by all the merchandise that people make all the art all the the arts and crafts it's yeah it still and blows my mind 10 years later yeah and what's really interesting too is i pulled some people who were fans of hedwig and musical theater I pulled them into the My ah, Little Pony. You got it going both ways. I had mentioned, yeah, I'd meant, obviously I'd mentioned it, talked about it. And so they looked it up and they watched it and they ended up becoming huge fans of the show um, as well. So uh, I do, you know, I, I love the, like, I love the fandom. I loved doing the two conventions that I actually ended up got, uh, getting to do. Um, you know, I love... I wish I could sing the magic inside for everyone, but I can't cause I don't have the right um, setup, but one day I will, uh, <laughs> but um, <clears throat> I'm getting more savvy, uh, tech savvy. But again, it's like, 
you know, to be able to go to a convention and to do that for you guys is like really special to me. So I'm hoping that because, because of my shows, because of Snowpiercer coming out, you know, Snowpiercer is a total Comic-Con thing. And I, I saw so many, you know, pony peeps at, bro at Comic-Con and they knew me, uh, you know, and yelling my name. And I thought that was really awesome because here I am in a different venue that I'm just being introduced to. And I've got this whole fan, like set of people who are already know who I am and, you know, who I connect with already. So, you know, I'm hoping that I can connect with the pony, um, with my, with the pony fans, like the, at like comic cons and things like that you know to kind of keep it going i don't think it's um, going to be long before we see you know crossover artwork of your pony oc in the snow piercer world that's going to happen that's it's oh, going to happen by the end of the totally con happen. i imagine <laughs> give it give it a few minutes give it a few hours and there'll be out of that i'm quite confident i can't wait i can't wait oh my god if well, someone would do if someone would do and they got to wait for the whole season to air first so they know okay. like what my my space is like in the and my train car essentially sure um but if if someone drew me miss audrey which is my character on snowpiercer um rara and um yitzhak in the same train car <laughs> it would be so Awesome. That's, that's the that's the request. That's the art that request. Is a total request. <laughs> it's been laid out to the community. I hope the community steps up for you because you deserve it. Thank, Thank you so you. much for joining oh, us. Oh God, it's my I'm, pleasure. I'm getting the, the two minute warning, so we got to wrap this cool. up. But thank you okay. so much for joining us and for sharing yeah, of course, your enthusiasm of course. and your stories. Yes, of course. Anytime, you know. I just love trying to take everyone's mind off of things going on and just yes. get people to smile for at least, you know, a little bit. Well, it is very much appreciated. Uh, your, your album is out right now. Uh, looking through the Villa Satori, Satori. <laughs> growing up, hate Ashbury. Yes. Yes. Oh, and if you tweet it, um, if you tweet at Lena Rocker Hall, say something about the album and then hashtag the Villa Satori, I will send you a bonus track. There you go, folks. <laughs> and Snowpiercer, May 17th. Lena Holt. May 17th, TNT. An absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for talking with us. Best wishes in everything. And thank you. take care and stay safe out there. You too. Thank you for having me. And everybody, please take care. <laughs> and thank you all for joining us as well in the stream. Um, next up, we have. Oh, I should know this because I'm on it. <laughs> we have the, uh... <laughs> oh, goodness. My brain is fried after an hour and a half. We have an awesome panel coming. Riffing, riffing, the riffing ponies, yes. Riffing Rainbow pony. is next, 7 p.m. Eastern. We'll see you there again. Lena Holt, thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. I'm going to keep waving. Yeah, I'm going to keep waving too <laughs> until I know we're off. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye. Goodbye. Give a clean wave. Bye. Bye. Goodbye. Hoopsies. 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 <laughs>